professor in both the Department of Pharmacology and Medicine. He has an MD, PhD, and this is one of his specialties. So we greatly appreciate his work. Um, he's been here 15 years, and um, everyone tells me that he is the person to get in the topic of hypertension. Um, so he will be talking with you some, and I know he will be willing to have your participation in any way that uh, you want. So please welcome Dr. Shepard talking about hypertension. Okay. Thank you, Michelle. I, I think, first of all, it would be useful to define the audience uh, so that I know how to talk. Um, in nurses? Yes. Nurse. Nurse. Administrator of nursing home. Okay. Nurse? Uh, recreational therapy. Okay. Nursing. Nurse? Occupational therapy. Okay. Nurse. Physical therapy. Nurse. Nurse. So it's mainly nurses and yourself? Huh? Nursing. Nursing. All right. Yeah. How many are faculty members? Teaching faculty. Teaching faculty, okay. Do you teach hypertension? Yes, not per se. Not per se, it's part of other problem areas. Right. Medical right. surgery. Okay. Well, I run the hypertension service, and uh, <clears throat> we have a lot of. We, we actually get the patients that nobody else can look after, and nobody else wants to look after. So we get a lot of complicated patients, but we do. Um, look after a lot of simple, easy to manage hypertensives too because we do a lot of research in hypertension and we use them as a kind of database if you like. We treat them and in return we ask them to go through some fairly rigorous research sometimes and usually they survive it and, uh, and there's not a problem. Um, my PhD is in geriatric clinical pharmacology and clinical pharmacology is the use of drugs uh, so that Hypertension is pretty much an ideal subject for me to be interested in because you spend the first two visits with the hypertensive diagnosing them and then like asthma and diabetes and all sorts of other diseases you spend the next 50 years of the patient's life treating them. So, and the treatment in almost all these cases is with drugs and so most of what we do for these patients is, is drug therapy. Let me just look initially. I don't. I have three slides at the end. I'm going to talk a little bit about that, but mostly I'm going to talk about who gets hypertension, what it's associated with, what harm it does to the patients, and what you should be doing about it. And I think these are the things that you need to know about. If you look at the relationship between age and hypertension, and we'll just go between 20 and 80 years. If you look at the incidence of diastolic hypertension. And diastolic hypertension, we did, we, the normal blood pressure is 120 over 80, of course. Now, that's normal, but George Pickering in the 1930s and 40s very truthfully said that blood pressure risk is a continuum. Okay, So 120 over 80 is actually more risky to the patient one, than 100 over 60. There's no magic line. It's just that we define hypertension as the level of blood pressure, A, at which there's increased risk, okay? So the risk is up, and B, the level of blood pressure at which we can reduce the risk by doing something about it. It's like uh, a patient with terminal cancer, all right? You say you're at increased risk of your disease, but we have no treatment, so there isn't any point in getting all fussed over what to do for you. You know, you might as well tell the patient to go and play golf because you're not going to do them any good by putting them through a lot of uh, trauma. So we need the two parts of the definition to be true to define it usefully as hypertension. Part of the treatment is drugs and part of the treatment is non-drug therapy. And I'll go into each of these in turn. But the incidence of hypertension in diastolic terms we call diastolic hypertension probably about a 95 diastolic. People vary. And uh, systolic hypertension is probably over greater than or equal to 160 over 95. I'm pretty aggressive about treating hypertension. I tend to treat 140 over 90 as well if there's no reason not to. We have lots and lots of patients who are untreated 
at 140 over 90. Now I personally would not like to have a blood pressure 140 over 90 because I know that it pretty much doubles my risk of dying in the next 10 years of some blood pressure related disease. Okay? We don't know for sure it benefits me to treat it, but just because we don't know for sure doesn't mean to say that we shouldn't. So if you take 160 over 95, and this is going to be uh, 50, okay? The incidence goes from about 20% here, and it levels off at about 40%. All right, so the risk of hypertension rises as you get older, and it levels off here. Now, why does it level off? It's not because there aren't as many people getting hypertension, it's because there are more people dying of their hypertension. So you're adding more people on the top, but you're killing people at the bottom as well. Okay, so that is a kind of a fallacious uh, graph, all right? With systolic, you're probably doing that, okay? It keeps going up. That tells you a couple of things, either that many more elderly people have got elevated systolic pressures or it's not as risky to them and it's probably a bit of both and I'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, the point is you're dealing with this group of patients it's pretty darn common. All right, probably up to half your patients are going to be hypertensive and are going to benefit from some kind of treatment. What, kind of tr what kinds of hypertension and what are the bases for, for the hypertension? Well, we know that blood pressure equals cardiac output times total peripheral resistance. In young folks, they have high cardiac output. In other words, their heart pumps more blood than they ought to. And the resistance fails to fall. It should fall. If you as a norm intensive without an exercise, your cardiac output would go up because your tissues need more blood. But your resistance would fall because the blood vessels would open up to let more blood through. In young hypertensives, the output goes up, but the resistance does not fall. That's why they have hypertension. So that's in the young people. Old, and I should say my definition of young, a young person to me is somebody who's younger than me and an old person somebody who's older than me, all right? And it's, it's a kind of a moving target for me, actually. The cardiac output in an old person is down or normal, okay? It's down in some cases because two-thirds of CHF is caused by hypertension. Most of the heart failure we see is not because of ischemic heart disease, it's because of hypertension. So these patients, are at pretty big risk of heart failure, and these are the ones with low cardiac outputs. And this resistance is elevated. That immediately tells you how you're going to treat this, doesn't it? In young people, you can reduce the cardiac output. And because this is inappropriately elevated, you can also reduce resistance. In old folks, you don't want to do anything to cardiac output you do want to do something to resistance. And I'll come back to that in a minute. There's a second kind of hypertension in the elderly that you'll see quite a bit of, and that's what they call systolic hypertension. Okay? That's where you get 200 over 90. You see a few of these patients. Sometimes even 220 over 70. I mean, just as exaggerated as that. Now, are these patients at risk? Well, there's European studies, big European studies, uh, showing, yes, there is increased risk of this. There's no doubt that old people, older people with pressures like this are at higher risk than if the pressure is 140 over 70. Okay, so there is, is risk. The second question is, is it worth treating these patients? And the answer is yes, it is worth treating these patients. We should try and get them as low as possible. Now you say, well, this is normal. This is the diastolic pressure. However, are we going to get this down without 
knocking the bottom out of their diastolic pressure. If you take the normal kind of hypertension, the pressure in a normal hypertensive goes from 120 over 80 to 140 over 90 to 160 over 100. You see the progression? Increase in 10 here, increase in 20 here. In other words, the systolic goes up about 2 millimeters for every 1 millimeter increase in the diastolic. The converse is true. You drop the blood pressure, you go from there to here, here to there. Now if that were true here, you'd go from, let's take this one here, 200 over 90. You go down to 180 over 80, that's all right. 160 over 70, 140 over 60. You can't do that, can you? Not an old person. Why not? What happens during systole, uh, beg your pardon, what happens during diastole, uh, when you have the 60, is coronary artery filling. The coronary arteries supply blood to the heart during diastole. So you can't take the diastolic down there. Fortunately, what happens is that we don't get the same progression of two for one. What we get is five or six to one difference. Okay? You can drop this from 200 to 180, that's 20, and only get three or four, maybe 86. Right? And you can drop this to 160 and go down to maybe 160 over 80. That's closer, isn't it? So we have a little bit of additional space. We can drop a systolic hypertension down much more without affecting diastolic, and that's kind of nice. Okay, <coughs> why would you get systolic hypertension in the elderly? Well, because you have the heart and you have the large blood vessels, and the heart pumps out 70 mils of blood every beat. And normally, in a young person, that 70 mils of blood goes into the large blood vessels. It goes straight into the, the aorta and the uh, carotids and the iliacs and femorals. And these are elastic arteries. They expand. It's like a balloon being stretched. And they accommodate this extra 70 mils in here. And they get bigger. Okay? So that the pressure doesn't go up much. But if this becomes rigid, like a steel pipe, which is what happens in the elderly, it doesn't expand, and so the pressure rises a great deal. And this pressure rises during systole, and it's that that makes the systolic blood pressure go up a lot. And so what your treatment is to make these less rigid. Okay, that's the aim of treatment with systolic hypertension. Okay. Now, I have a question for you. Am I pitching this at the right level, or am I making it too easy or too hard? I'm trying to figure out how you're going to make it less rigid. <laughs> <laughs> this or my lecture? <laughs> no, no. This. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm going to work on that in a minute. Okay, um, let us now think about how to treat hypertension. I don't think it's worthwhile going into the investigation of hypertension in the elderly. Or would you like me to talk about that? You probably don't do the investigation, so it's probably not all that <coughs> relevant. But what I would say is that you need to, first of all, exclude secondary hypertension. That's the first thing you need to do. Okay? And the one thing you really need to exclude in the elderly is renovascular hypertension. Okay, do you know what that is? <coughs> All right. The aorta, renal arteries, two kidneys. All right. In old folks, especially males, especially whites, especially males who are old, who are white, and who smoke. Okay, old white smoking males get this. If any of them survive, that is. <coughs> what they get is atheroma sitting in their, in their uh, renal arteries. Same as they get it here, same as they get it in their coronary arteries and their, and their carotids. And what happens is there's pressure, normal pressure here, low pressure here, because this is obstructed. The kidneys don't like that. They secrete stuff called renin. Renin makes angiotensin II. Angiotensin II is a pressor agent. 
kidney is very selfish. What it does is it wants the right pressure. It'll do anything to get that. So what it does is it secretes all this stuff which constricts the arteries, which puts the pressure up here, the mean pressure say from 100 up to 120, and puts the mean pressure from 70, which was low, up to 95. Kidney's happy, the rest of the body isn't very happy because it's seeing high blood pressure. Okay, there's still a drop across here, but this, this organ is happy, very selfish organ. And it's quite common in the elderly. If you see a, a male age 70 or 75, who's normotensive, mildly hypertensive, who suddenly becomes very hypertensive, you must think of renovascular hypertension. And it's quite easy to treat, okay? A lot of the times, an a, a radiologist can slip a little catheter in there with a balloon on the end of it, just like coronary angiography or coronary angioplasty, squish the atheroma against the sides there and open it up. It's quite successful but you must look for it. The second thing you need to do is take a good, uh, do a good physical exam. You'll only ever do one if you're a physician on the, each patient. The rest of the time you're so used to the patient that you miss things. You know, I mean, I missed a patient with hypothyroidism because <coughs> I'd been looking after him for 15 years and he'd just gradually been getting thinner hair, croakier voice, thicker skin, putting on weight and feeling worse, and I didn't see it. And what made it worse was that the person who saw it was an ophthalmologist, okay? Can you believe it? An ophthalmologist diagnosing hypothyroidism. He looked in his eyes and he saw the changes diagnostic of hypothyroidism. And he sent it back to me and said, this guy's hypothyroid, and of course he was grossly hypothyroid. The same thing happens in hypertension. If you don't look for it, the first time you see the patient, you're gonna miss it. The third thing you're gonna do is a lab. Now what lab are you going to do? You're going to do a SMAC20, you're going to do a CBC, a UA, and an ECG. You don't need to do all the fancy things. Serum rhubarb levels, fine. Do them in the Mayo Clinic. You don't need to do them out in, in Kerrville, all right? That's all you need to do for each hypertensive. Okay, treating your hypertensive. Do any of you try to change your patient's habits? Are any of you successful? Never. No, it's, it's impossible, isn't it? You should try them. What are the habits that each patient has that makes them more likely to die from heart disease? I mean, when you're treating a hypertensive, all you're doing is reducing one risk of coronary artery disease or cardiovascular disease. It's only one of 10 things. What are the things that increase your risk from uh, cardiovascular disease? Eating habits. Hmm? Eating habits. Yeah. Just be more specific. Okay. What else? Lack of exercise. Exercise or lack of. Did you say smoking? Smoking. smoking. Anything else? What are the risk factors for cardiovascular disease? Heredity. Yeah, you didn't choose your parents very well. I mean, they may have been nice parents, but they probably <laughs> weren't, weren't appropriate for hypertension. Anything else? Diabetes. Diabetes is one. Yeah, we, we don't know for sure that treating the diabetes lowers the risk of heart disease. That's one of the problems. We treat the diabetes and they don't die of diabetes, but we don't know if it helps the heart disease. What else? There's a couple of other things. Anxiety. Anxiety, yes. Stress, basically. Race? <coughs> um, yes, indirectly, because African Americans are more likely to get hypertension and more likely to die of cardiovascular disease, yeah. A couple of others. Male sex, right? Age, okay, you don't die of heart disease at the age of 20. Uh, 10, hypertension. With fat, I'm gonna uh, talk about intake and cholesterol levels, okay? 
I'm going to kind of put them together because one dictates the other, but also your parents tend to dictate what your cholesterol level is. Now, which of these do you think, for the average person, is the thing you need to reduce first? I mean, I'm going on the basis you can only do one thing for each patient at one time. They won't change more than one thing. Well, what can't you change? If you have a young person that does have a high cholesterol, what Yes, um, which, which in your average patient? Let's talk about elderly patients now, okay? Sometimes, which is the most? Smoking. Smoking is the one, actually. It's the one thing that in an average population, if you were to take 100 people over 65 and try and do one thing to stop them dying of heart disease or cardiovascular <coughs> disease, the one thing would be smoking. What proportion do you think of people smoke over 65? <coughs> Is it higher or lower than younger people, do you think? Higher. It's higher. Because when they started smoking, they didn't know it was bad. Right? I mean, in fact, if you look at what happened in the First and Second World Wars, the army gave away cigarettes. Right? As a means of keeping the, the soldiers from complaining about being stuck in awful conditions. The problem is that smoking is a means of getting a drug into your blood. It's a very inefficient way and a very dirty way, isn't it? Because you get several thousand carcinogens in as well as the nicotine, which is what you're addicted to. And nicotine is probably only second to cocaine in its addictive potential. All right? It's highly addictive. In fact, one of the uh, ads for chewing tobacco. Remember they're not allowed to promote smoking on TV, right? You don't see any TV ads for smoking. But they have been allowed to promote chewing tobacco, all right? And what they're doing is they're pitching it at young males because it's a manly man thing to do, all right? And if you don't spit black stuff all over the pavement, you're not a real man, okay? And the point is, they advertise it as saying, if we can get you chewing our tobacco for two weeks, you're hooked. And in fact, that's true. You're addicted to nicotine, and it's extremely difficult to stop. We've tried all sorts of things. I mean, there's all sorts of programs, and most of them have 15, 20% efficacy at best. So it's very, very addictive. Um, Latin Americans smoke about the same as Anglo-Whites and African-Americans about the same as well. Probably the highest number who smoke though are elderly male Latin Americans. Okay? And they're also uh, going to be uh, drinking a lot of beer and, and alcohol and the two kind of go together because the alcohol diminishes the resistance to the things that are bad for you <coughs> and so you tend to do more of that. So the first thing is smoking discontinuation. Um, I've been looking after some patients for 15 years and they're still smoking. It's just really hard to do. So I don't give up on it. Some people do stop and they're the ones that are motivated. But who's motivated? It's the young, intelligent, it's the yups, isn't it? Okay, it's not the gups. Okay, not the geriatric, upwardly mobile ones. It's, it's the young people. And there are certainly fewer young people smoking, although women are tending to smoke more because they're going to the workplace and they're seeing a lot of advertising for cigarettes and so on. So young women are tending to smoke a little more, but by and large, the young group smokes less than the older group. So there's some hopeful trends there. And what we're relying on really is public health trends is becoming less socially acceptable to smoke. We see, I mean, I go to Europe a lot because I come from there. When I go there, there are no separate areas for non-smoking, right? Uh, same as there were, what, five or six years ago, something like that. The next thing you'll see in Europe is smoking sections, which are right in the good area of the restaurant, as, as, it, as it was here. I used to have to sit in, down beside the kitchen in the restrooms when I didn't smoke in a restaurant here. And now, the restaurant owners are seeing that more people don't smoke and so they put the non-smokers in the front and they relegate the smokers to the back. And that's going to change 
uh, people's um, acceptability, the acceptability of it. And if you go over to the VA, you see everybody standing outside in 95 degrees, and I think that's a pretty good way to... Well, it used to be in the VA, you know, the triage area, they were allowed to smoke in the triage area. It's not long since they stopped that, and then they put them in the outside sitting area, and they smoked there, and you had to walk through the smoke to get to your clinic to treat the people who smoked. And uh, <laughs> now you hope there's a strong wind blowing because they're standing outside, and you hope they're blowing the smoke away from you. That's probably the most useful thing to do, but it's also the most difficult. What do you think is this usually the second? You can't do anything about male sex, although some people do try. Um, <laughs> A lot of people do a lot about that, at least externally anyway. Um, you know, they uh, hook the skin up to the top of their head and <laughs> stretch it a little bit. You can't do much about these two. Uh, you can't do much about your parents, at least not in terms of choosing them. I'll put age, <coughs> age in twice there. Uh, what about stress? Can you do anything about that? You can. You can't do much about the stress itself. But you can do quite a lot about how you perceive the stress, I think. And I think that's what you should aim for. Uh, you have to make people who are in jobs like we're in where you never finish the job. You know what I mean? You go home at night every night having left a lot of stuff to do. That actually is one of the ways that we make monkeys and rats hypertensive, is we make it impossible for them to complete the task we set them. Okay? So that actually is a very powerful way to make animals hypertensive and we do it to ourselves by leaving a lot of stuff on our desk when you go home at night and taking on too much and you being ladies and probably bringing up families you have uncompleted stuff at home and you have uncompleted stuff at work and it's it's much more difficult so it's the perception of stress and I'm not an expert in that except to say that I think you have to be willing to leave things uncompleted and accept that that's the way it is I mean when they close the lid on the wooden box they put you on, there's still going to be stuff needing done. So I don't think you should worry too much about it. <coughs> okay? So that's a perception thing. What about fat intake? We can do a lot about that, can't we? Um, what can we do? Well, there's a lot of public health involved here too. It's to do with the perception again. Um, probably the ultimate thing that I saw being done was McDonald's in introducing a lean burger. Okay, uh, A Big Mac has got how many grams of fat? Is it, uh, uh, is it 40 or something? It's some horrible amount. It's at least twice your daily requirement of fat. It's at least 60 percent of your daily requirement of salt. Okay, it's, it's just a terrible way to live and that's one of the things that we do to ourselves is in this country we eat a lot of instant meals right and the way that people who make manufactured food make them tasty is they add a lot of salt okay um, you can actually get used to a low salt diet but the first time you take a low salt diet it tastes like cardboard what you find is if you put a patient in hospital make them eat a low, low fat low salt diet for a while right uh, for two weeks, say, and then put them on a regular diet, they won't be able to eat it because their taste buds are acclimatized to the low salt. So a low salt diet, you can get them used to. A low fat diet takes a little more. Have you tasted the lean burger in McDonald's? It tastes like what it really is. It's like the sole of a shoe that you've been walking on for quite a long time. It's terrible. It's the fat that gives it the juiciness, the, the texture, and the taste. Okay, And getting rid of that is difficult. But we can substitute saturated fats for unsaturated fat, and that helps a bit. The problem is that when you boil fat, even vegetable oil, you saturate it. So when you boil stuff in fat, like I mean by that I mean frying stuff, you should only use it once or twice. Because when you use it fourth, fifth, and sixth times, it's become more and more saturated. You put more hydrogen bonds in there, and it's no longer unsaturated fat. The problem is we cannot make some of the polyunsaturated fats ourselves. We need some small amount. We don't need the saturated fat. We can make that ourselves. So reducing the saturated fat is what we need to do. 
What else do we need to do about uh, fat intake? Well, we need to drink milk, which is skimmed, or 1.5%. And 1.5% sounds pretty low, but I think, can, are, do you have any dietitians here? Okay, I can say what I like. No, I can't. You have to help me if I go wrong. 1.5%, I think it's got 4 grams of fat, right? Instead of 9 grams per helping. Is that right? For the whole milk? Yes. Yeah. So it's not that low, right? It, what we have in our house is a skim, which is basically zero fat. The children, as a treat to the weekends, get to drink one and a half. You give them full fat milk and they can't drink it because it tastes far too creamy for them. Yeah, yeah. What, what happens is, that initially, this, this is basically just chalky water, right? I mean, that's basically all it is, but it's got protein in it and it's, it's got some uh, carbohydrate in it. But you need to get people used to drinking these two things. And that's not that hard to do. Okay, so that's one thing you can do. Reducing uh, protein intake. That's another thing you can do because protein is not essentially bad. We waste the extra protein. We normally eat about, what, 90 grams of protein a day. We need about, what, 40? Is that about right? Hmm? Average, about 40 to 50. 40 to 50. Right. So uh, we waste the rest. It goes out in the feces and the urine. It's not stored, mainly. So it's wasted. We're eating, actually, an awful lot of extra protein. The problem is not the protein. The fact is, though, the protein comes with fat. You know, the marbled meat and the, the eggs, OK, and all that stuff, it comes with fat. And that's another thing you can do. And the other thing you need to do is increase the veggies. Okay? We're basically vegetarians. We're not omnivores. We only became omnivores when we invented the machine gun, okay? And the ability to hunt things, that's what I mean. We're basically uh, taking a diet which is not what we were designed for. We were designed for a diet which was high in potassium and low in sodium, which is a vegetarian diet. Now, it's been shown that diets which are high in potassium and low in sodium reduce your blood pressure, for one thing. Okay? And diets which are high in calcium reduce your blood pressure. So that there are things we can do, not only for our cholesterol levels, but also for our blood pressure, and of course for our bones as well. I'm not going to talk about osteoporosis, but we do need to increase the, the calcium intake to a gram or two a day. Okay, I think the other important thing to remember is that the cholesterol level in your blood is the most, probably the most important biochemical predictor of heart disease. And the cholesterol level is proportional to the amount of fat you take in. Okay, exercise. How much exercise? How much exercise do you think older people should be taking? Should they be doing aerobics twice a day or? Depends on what they do. Yeah. How much do you think they need to do to, to reduce? Well, what we're trying to do is we're trying to say, you do the amount of exercise that gets most of the benefit as far as r risk reduction. How much do you think you need to do to? 20 minutes, at least three times a week. Of what? Aerobic. What is aerobics? Yeah. I should tell you that walking reasonably briskly for 20 minutes, three times a day, is all that's needed. Three times a week. Three times a week. <laughs> <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> It's been a long day for me. Okay? It's not much. If you can do it every day, I mean, what is 20 minutes brisk walking? You walk at, say, four miles an hour if you're doing fairly well. So between a mile and, a two, and two miles, three, four times a week. That's about what gives you most of the benefit from reduction of cardiovascular risk. Okay? Now, you don't lose weight with this because when you exercise, you feel better and you eat more. But what you do is you change the fat into, the, into protein. You change the body habitus. So that the person, instead of weighing 160, 
with 60% fat and 40% everything else might have 50% fat and 50% everything else. And remember that fat, fat is lighter than everything else, so losing a lot of fat right, doesn't gain you as much weight loss as putting on a, the same volume of protein. Does that make sense? If you change it for protein, you can actually put on weight. But it's, it's good rather than bad to do that. So don't take the weight as being the thing. It's how much lean body mass you have. All right? Uh, probably the best two exercises are swimming and cycling. Why these two? Because yes, the not imp non-impact exercises. Okay. Yeah. Did you have? Yes, it is. It's better because you don't need to wear a crash helmet. <laughs> All right. Uh, cycling in this place is dangerous. It really is. I used to ride, ride a motorcycle, and the uh, the uh, the trucks that would go by would throw beer cans at me to try and knock me off my bike. You know, it was it was pretty scary. So you got to be careful in this place. So I would actually recommend stationary cycling. Okay, but that I mean, don't just sit on your bike and stay stationary. I mean, get on a stationary bike. Okay. <laughs> I think swimming has another benefit too, you know, everything that was down here when you're standing outside the swimming pool is now up here, and so you look and feel much better too, I think, always makes you more optimistic about life. Okay, so these are probably the exercises, diabetes, there is um, a relationship between diabetes and hypertension. If you're diabetic, you're more likely to have hypertension. If you're hypertensive, you're more likely to have diabetes. And diabetes kills a lot of people. It kills them basically in two ways. They basically get peripheral vascular disease, small vessel disease. They get ulcers in their feet and their ankles. They get gangrene. They get sepsis. And the problem for the surgeon is he doesn't know where to chop the leg off because he has to chop it at a point where the tissue will heal when he sews it together. Now, if you have an ulcer on your ankle, you may end up taking the leg off below the knee. That's a major disability, okay? But he does that for two reasons. First of all, he has to go way above where the hair loss is, right? And secondly, he has to try, if he can, go through a joint. Because when you have a joint, you have a smooth surface. If you chop it halfway up a, 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 the shaft of a bone, it's a rough surface, very painful, hard to get a smooth thing that you can put weight on. Okay, and That's why they go through the knee or below the knee or above the knee, and very seldom through the ankle or, or just above the ankle. Okay, But it's a major problem for old folks because they're, you know, they're unstable, they're now on crutches, they have trouble walking, uh, all sorts of problems. The second thing that kills them is renal disease. Okay, the, the kidneys start to leak protein and they develop what we call Kimmel-Steel uh, Kimmel uh, Wilson kidneys and they, they die of renal failure. That's a bad sign. And one of the treatments I'll talk about in a minute is to do with uh, reducing the progression of renal disease in these folks. Okay. And how do you treat diabetes? Well, insulin is best, by far and away the best. The oral hypoglycemics, by and large, are an excuse for the people to keep eating too much. Okay? That, that's kind of what they are for people that don't like to stick needles in themselves. Hypertension. How are you going to treat hypertension in the elderly? Well, Total peripheral resistance is up. That's what you're going to reduce. Okay? Some of the other things that you've done. Exercising will reduce blood pressure a little bit. Weight loss will reduce blood pressure about 10 millimeters for 10 pounds weight loss in most people. What else will reduce blood pressure? Increasing your calcium and your potassium will do it a little bit. 
but by and large, you're going to be stuck with giving drugs. Now, 50% of your patients will be okay on one drug. 90% on two drugs, and the rest will need more than two. It's important that you choose the right first drug, isn't it? Because half your patients are only going to need one. And if you don't choose the right drug, you're going to be futzing around for months trying to get the right drug, bringing them back, and so on and so on. It's expensive, it's time consuming, and so on. So what do you do? The increased resistance is the first thing you have to do. The second thing you have to do, what, is, what do you think is the most common reason that patients stop taking their drugs? That's the second most common reason that they make you feel bad. Too expensive. It's the cost. Right. Yeah. I'm, I'll talk about cost in a minute. And the third thing is adverse effects. So what you need is a drug that will bring the pathology back to normal, so it'll reduce resistance. It has low cost and it has low incidence of adverse effects. Now, there are two kinds of drugs in this world. There are old drugs and there are new drugs. Okay? It's very simple. The old ones are cheap and the new ones are expensive. And if you look at their ability to lower blood pressure. Let's look at the years here. 1950, 1990. I'll not bother with the next three years. This is 100% ability to lower blood pressure. In 1950, we could lower blood pressure in about 50% of patients. But it did that. Okay? So, round about 75, somewhere about there, we lost all ability to lower blood pressure more. What I'm saying is the new drugs don't lower blood pressure mo better or more efficiently or in any way better than uh, the older drugs. Using the drugs developed here is just fine. Now, these drugs are out with their patent. That means that any generic drug house can produce them. That means they're cheap. It costs $220 million. I'll put a couple of dots in there to make it look more impressive. It costs that much to produce a drug now. And it's not the drug company's fault, despite what Billary is, is saying, or Hillary is saying. It's not the drug company's making excessive profits. And I'm not an advocate of the pharmaceutical industry. It's because we demand drugs that are safe. And that's not unreasonable. They spend all this money. They spend probably 15 million in advertising it. But the rest goes on development. It goes on the other 990 drugs that didn't make it. Right? They use huge numbers of compounds to make one drug. The point is that we demand safe drugs. They spend all this money in testing. OK? But the point of this talk is that that makes them expensive. They have to sell an awful lot of drug, and they have to charge a lot. Way down here, 20, 30 years ago, the research costs are all written off. And now all you have left is the cost of <coughs> making the chemical, putting it in a tablet, testing it for stability, putting it in a bottle, and sending it off to the VA or the medical center hospital. Because we don't go through distributors. We get drugs straight from, straight from manufacturer. We buy in bulk. And I'm sure most of the situations in which you people work are the same way. It's becoming more and more the same way. The small pharmacy is going to go out very soon. OK? So these drugs can be very cheap. Let's, uh, can you switch the overhead on for me? The, not the overhead, the uh, thing. And if you can point it approximately at this wall over here. <coughs> Try not to go to sleep in the next two minutes. <coughs> What do I need to do? Um, Any clues? Sometimes Which one? Turn it off. Yeah, your remote's in back over here, and then this goes like that. 
Okay. And the remote is. Well, unless you want to just press the next button. I only have two or three slides. Okay, good, thanks. All right, can you see that? A little small. Yeah, I'm going to put it right out for a second or two. Okay, that's good. Can you see that now? Okay, I can't see where I am anymore. That's okay, though. Oh, later. Yeah, oh, yeah, this works, too. All right. This is the cost in dollars of a month's supply. That's the red book price. That's basically what the VA pharmacy or the medical center pharmacy pays. Look at the difference. Thiazide diuretics. That's hydrochlorothiazide, trichlormethiazide, you know, NACWA, all these old things, the diuretics. What's the cost? 12 cents a month. Okay, that's uh, $1.50 a year. That's not going to break the bank. Lasix or loop diuretic, 20 cents a month, $2.50 a year. Propranolol, which is the oldest beta blocker, developed around about the uh, late 60s, 60 cents a month, 7 or $8 a year. Nadolol, which is a newer beta blocker, it has only one advantage, and that is that you can take it once a day instead of twice a day, costs 31 bucks. There is no other advantage that we can determine, except that it's better marketed. Why is it better marketed? Because it's still generic, and so a drug company makes money out of advertising it. This stuff is generic, and therefore, and, and generic companies don't spend money on advertising. So nobody advertises this stuff. So doctors don't prescribe it as much, because doctors are like people going through a, a store they take the brightest package, or the best advertising, or the most familiarity with the name, and they buy that stuff. It's the same with drugs. Now, is it justified using Nadalol instead of Propranolol? Basically, it's not. Okay? This is new, this is old. This is twice a day, this is once, no other differences. Hydralazine has been around since the early 1950s. First used it in rabbits in 1953, and they all dropped the blood pressure. 80 cents a month. 10 bucks a year. Now we come to the expensive hydralazines. Okay? These drugs all basically do the same thing. They all dilate up the blood vessels. So they all drop total peripheral resistance. And so they're all appropriate for older people. Hydralazine, 10 bucks a year. Alpha blockers like Minipress, Prazosin, Doxazosin, up to 26 bucks. Say 20 bucks a month. That's $250 a year. That's 25 times as expensive as this. ACE inhibitors, that's the, that's the ones that in, uh, prevent uh, the renin, effect of renin. Captopril, enalapril, lisinopril, benazapril, fosinopril, all the other pills. 45 bucks a month. What's that? That's almost $600 a year. Calcium blockers, that's Cardizum, Procardia, Verapamil, which is uh, Isoptin. Okay, about the same price, five or six hundred bucks a year. Now you'd have to make a very strong case for actually using these in an ideal world over these in order to justify spending between 20 and 100 times as much, wouldn't you? I mean, there aren't many situations where you would get away with spending all this extra money without really knowing very much about the advantages of these over these. There are some advantages in some instances, and I'll, I'll talk about them very briefly, but by and large, I'm a, not a therapeutic nihilist, but I don't believe that we're justified in using the new drugs over the old drugs very often. Uh, uh, let's just go over the next, I have two more slides. If you can go forward to the next one, could you? We've heard a lot of bad press about diuretics, thiazide diuretics, okay? You hear a lot of bad things about them. What do you hear? They cause a low blood potassium in quite a lot of patients. Well, the average decline is about six milliequivalents per liter, okay? So 
since the average range is from 3.5 to 5, you can go from 4.5 to 3.9. You're still within the normal range. But it depends on the baseline. The lower the potassium is, the more likely you are to become hypokalemic. You can easily prevent it. You can use potassium sparing diuretics. You can add spironolactone to it. It costs an extra dollar a month. Okay? Very few side effects. The other thing they say, fallen potassium is nearly max. Uh, it, the, you have to do more lab work, okay, to check the fallen potassium. Well, if you check the potassium after a month, you're going to catch all the reduction in potassium. So that really is, is, a, is a fallacious argument to say that you're going to get hypokalemia. You can detect it and prevent it very easily. You get lots of adverse effects. That's what they say. Okay, less than 6% to the patients have to withdraw from the therapy. Bad effect on the blood lipids. Lipids. That just plain isn't true. The effect, if any, is mild and it's transient. It goes away after a few months. So at the end of two years, the lipids are just, the cholesterol is just the same as it was. It worsens insulin resistance and, and causes hyperglycemia. In other words, it worsens diabetes. That's only true if you let them become hypokalemic. If you stop the hypokalemia from happening, you prevent most of the insulin resistance getting worse. So that diuretics get a bum rap, basically, is what it is. And it's because nobody is their advocate, except for me, all right? And I've never been on national television saying this, so I'm less effective than the drug companies. But the diuretics are all produ produced by generic companies. Nobody advertises them. But you should use them. They're very good drugs. They're very effective in the elderly. And you should choose the cheapest one. The cheapest one is hydrochlorothiazide. The dose you should use is 0 0.0625 milligrams a day. Okay? That's, that's a quarter of the smallest tablet. And you should not increase the dose more than once a month. Because if you do, the maximum effect of the previous dose has not been reached. So you may get more effect than you want. And the maximum dose you should use is about 25 milligrams a day. That will reduce blood pressure by between 10 and 15 millimeters of mercury diastolic in most of your hypertensives without any side effects. Most of the side effects that were seen in the very early studies were seen with 100 or 200 milligrams a day of hydrochlorothiazide. We don't use these doses anymore. The only problem we have really with diuretics, I think, that we need to watch out for is in males, when we use a potassium sparing diuretic, we usually use spironolactone, aldactone, and the combination is called aldactazide, although there's now a generic, which is about a quarter of the price, and is just, a, just as effective. We get gynecomastia in males, and it's usually unilateral, and it's painful, and males object to that. So you have to watch out for that. The next slide is basically putting the same things about beta blockers, now, I should say that you don't really want to use beta blockers in the elderly, because remember, they work by reducing cardiac output, and they have normal or low cardiac output already. You don't want to do that very much. But you should still use beta blockers where required. They say there's lots of adverse effects, adverse drug reactions. 13%, it's about the same as with captopril, the new drugs. Okay, no difference. Bad effect on lipids, usually around 5%. That is a real problem, but it's a small problem. Problems in diabetics who become hypoglycemic. If you put them on beta blockers and they're diabetics and they become hypoglycemic, they won't know it until they become unconscious. If they're diabetic, the blood sugar is going down, they get headaches, they get sweaty, they get shaky. If they're on a beta blocker, that'll mask all these side effects and the first thing you'll know is that they're unconscious and that's quite embarrassing when they're driving along 410 in the rush hour, okay? They need to know about it before they become unconscious. Bronchospasm, yes it occurs. Don't use beta blockers in patients with asthma or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, bronchitis and emphysema. You should avoid them in these uh, things. And if you do these things, beta blockers are good drugs. They don't work that well in the elderly, but we can use them sometimes. If you can, you can put the slide off now, please, if you can figure out how to do it. Let's see if I can. I can maybe do it here. 
We can do it here. Can you? Okay. I can put this up. Okay. So, how are you going to start your old person on drugs? <coughs> Have I been talking too long already? No, you're fine. I've got another. Okay. Yes, if you have questions, think of them now. Okay, what are you going to do for the old person? Hydrochlorothiazide is point zero, a big pardon, 6.25 milligrams, big pardon. I said point zero sixty-five. Six six and a quarter milligrams QD times one month. And you can increase it, double it up to 25 milligrams a day. That's the first step. Second step, you want to keep it cheap, is hydralazine. 25 milligrams twice a day, up to 50 milligrams three times a day. The problem with hydralazine, two problems actually, one is you'll get fluid retention, you get ankle swelling. You've already prevented that with a diuretic. The other problem is that you will get an increase in cardiac output, an increase in heart rate. That doesn't really happen in the elderly. It happens in young people. If we give you ladies or myself a dose of hydralazine, we get a real fast heart rate, we get a headache, we get palpitations. Older folks don't get that. But if it does happen, you can add a little bit of propranolol, 20 to 40, twice a day. Now there you have three drug therapy. But you're only taking drugs in general terms. You can exclude that. We virtually never go up there. You're taking drugs twice a day. That's easy. Same therapy in the morning as at night. And only about one in ten will need the third drug. So one or two drugs twice a day. It's pretty easy. Now people say, well, we need to get to once a day drugs because people remember to take them more. Well, that's just not true. 65% compliance with once a day, 62% with twice a day. Okay, no, no difference. It's less than 50% with three drugs, okay? Gets worse. The thing that strikes me most about this is the fact that less than two thirds of your patients are doing what you think, okay? That kind of worries me a bit. And I fool myself, I kid myself that our patients don't do that sort of thing. <laughs> I suspect they do. But I've been looking after them for long enough and I know when they refill the prescriptions and I know they do it on time and I make them bring the bottles with them and I make them tell me what's in the bottles and, and what they're taking. So they know pretty much. And so if they're, if they're not taking them, then they're doing it deliberately as a malicious uh, attempt to subvert the righteousness that we're trying to inflict upon them, etc. I sound like David Koresh here, don't I? Mm -hmm. I'm not planning to immolate myself, so don't worry. Okay. Alternatively, if you're treating somebody with lots and lots of money, what you can do is, that's the cheap way, okay? The expensive way is you can use calcium blockers. You can use verapamil. You can use up to 240 milligrams twice a day. That's a calcium blocker. And they have extended release preparations so that they're absorbed more slowly from your gut. Problems with this, constipation, big time. Because this stuff stops smooth muscle working. A lot of the smooth muscle you have is in your gut. Older folks have diabetic neuropathy, they have diabetic GI problems, so their GI tract doesn't work very well anyway. They don't exercise much so that they don't get the stimulus for their bowel to move. I mean, if you notice, look at a field of cattle, what happens in the morning? They get up, they walk, they defecate, right? It's the same with humans. Not exactly, but... <laughs> Not, not kind of like that, but I'm, what I mean is that if they don't exercise, 
they get constipated, and that's what happens. Okay, this makes it worse. Also, old for folks tend to eat diets that are low in fiber. I mean, it's just it's just a real problem. So they get constipated and they get ankle swelling. Now that's a problem because a lot of older folks have got varicose veins, and they got stasis, some of them have had strokes and so they don't use the muscles and so their ankles get swollen and this makes it worse. So it's not the perfect drug but it works fairly well and it's the cheapest of the calcium blockers. Diltiazem or Cardazem is the most expensive and it works the same as this. It just gives you the pleasure of spending more money, that's all. The second thing you would do after you've done that and it hasn't worked all that well is you'd add diuretic. Okay, you can't get away from diuretics in old folks. They're low cost, few adverse effects, and they work pretty well. And after that, you can go to a whole bunch of other things, and I don't think you want a dissertation in therapeutics. In fact, I suspect you don't want anything at all. Um, if you have any questions about real life situations or people you've seen in our problem, I mean, you have all sorts of problems because you have asthmatics, right? You have COPD patients, patients that smoke, so you can't use beta blockers. You have drug interaction problems, uh, all sorts of interactions. These are beneficial interactions, okay? This lowers pressure, but causes fluid retention, which you get rid of with this. It causes increase in heart rate, which you get rid of with this. That's beneficial interactions. But we get all sorts of interactions. Advil increases blood pressure, okay? Ibuprofen, Motrin, whatever you want to call it. So we have to watch out for these things. Some non-steroidals lower, uh, uh, increase blood pressure less than others. Um, it's always difficult uh, to know which ones. Uh, the drugs which increase blood pressure, what are they? They are weight reduction pills, okay? Anorexians. What's the anorexian that we see in Kroger's? You walk around Kroger's and what do you see? You see phenylephrine, okay? Side effect of phenylephrine is anorexia, but phenylephrine is what we use to increase blood pressure. We use it in our studies. Amphetamines, they increase blood pressure. Okay, what else? This place is the world capital for allergies. How do we treat allergies? Decongestants. What are decongestants? They're vasoconstrictors. What do they do? They increase blood pressure. Okay, and for younger people, there's all sorts of things. For females, there's oral contraceptives. There's an average of eight millimeters increase in diastolic pressure going on oral contraceptives. It's quite a lot. For males, there's anabolic steroids that young men take. One in seven young men, men uh, leaving high school has taken anabolic steroids. And the reason is football. Football is just a very bad game. Okay, it was okay until they started putting all this armor plating on, and that let them hit each other full full steam, and so size and strength became more important than agility for the forwards. And so all the young men who want to become football stars now put on huge amounts of bulk. Okay? And to do that, most of them need anabolic steroids. And it puts the blood pressure up. It's a big problem. Because the muscle, when they're 15, turns into fat when they're 30. Because when they're 30, they're not t t thinking about football, they're thinking about mortgages, how to keep their job, you know, and how many packets of cigarettes they can smoke in a day. So it, it's a real problem uh, to me, football. I quite enjoy watching it, of course, but uh, it's a different thing. So these, these things will try and prevent you from lowering blood pressure. These are all social things that we do to each other. All right, uh, does anybody have any questions about hypertension? Any anxieties? In your patient, you 